Welcome to Russian History Retold. Episode 237, The Plagues and Epidemics in Russian History. Last time, we covered Russia's poet, the famous Anna Akhmatova. Today, as you can tell, we're going in a completely different direction. Now, I don't think I could have come up with a timelier episode than this one. With the COVID-19 pandemic having ravaged our world for the past few years, I felt the need to talk about the plagues and epidemics that affected Russia and its history over the centuries. As some of you may know, my real-life job is in the healthcare field, and I've sat on a board of directors of a trust that actually investigated communicable diseases. Perfect timing for the COVID pandemic. Now, plagues, epidemics, and pandemics have plagued humankind ever since we stopped being hunter-gatherers. The people who inhabited the land of the Rus before the time of the invasion of the Varangians were both pastoral and hunter-gatherers. This kept most communicable diseases away from them. There is evidence that many of the people who lived at the time had actually longer lifespans than those who lived later in the cities of Kiev and Rus. As stated in the book, the Journey of Man by Spencer Wells, quote, While the incidence of broken bones and wounds is greater for Paleolithic humans than for their sedentary Neolithic descendants, they do not appear to have died younger. In fact, the skeletal remains from early agricultural communities suggest that early agriculturists may have had a shorter lifespan than their hunter-gatherer neighbors. This is thought to be due largely to an increase and disease. Wells goes on further to say, quote, Most diseases can only exist in large populations, where a threshold number of people remain infected, allowing the disease to remain in the population. These are so-called endemic diseases, such as smallpox or typhoid. A population of several hundred thousand is necessary to maintain the disease, otherwise it is lost because not enough people remain susceptible to infection. My sources for today's podcast include the aforementioned The Journey of Man, a genetic odyssey by Spencer Wilms, A Disease by Mary Dobson, Russia and the Russians, a history by Jeffrey Hosking, Medieval Russia, 980 to 1584 by Janet Martin, Crimea, the Great Crimean War, 1854 to 1856 by Trevor Royal, The Coming Plague by Laurie Garrett, and finally, The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history by John M. Berry. The first epidemic in history that we know of was the 1200 BC one that occurred in ancient Babylon. Other famous ones that appeared in the old world that we know of include the Antonine Plague in Rome, which ravaged the empire between 165 and 190 AD, as well as the Plague of Justinian that spread as far as today's Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan in the years 541 to 549. As for the land of the Rus, we hear of our first outbreak during the most devastating plague in human history, the Black Death of 1346 to 1353. The Black Death was first found in present-day southern Russia and Ukraine as early as 1346. Peskov began to get ravaged in the beginning of 1352 and Novgorod by, the, uh, by August of the same year. By the end of 15, or 1352, two-thirds of Peskov's citizens were dead. This continued throughout Lithuania and northeastern Russia. It would hit Moscow in 1353, killing the Grand Prince, Simeon the Proud, as well as his brother and two of his sons. Of the Danilovich line, only the new Grand Prince, Ivan II, would survive. This pandemic was likely caused by Yersinia pestis, a bacterium, something that had been verified by scientists in 2010. Some had claimed that smallpox was the cause, but that theory has been abandoned by most researchers. The longer-term effect of the Black Death killing as many people as it did was to weaken the Mongol Golden Horde, allowing Ivan's successor, Dmitry Donskoy, to hand the Mongols their first major military loss to the Rus at the Battle of Kulikova. <laughs> 
It would also weaken the Rus as Dmitri's successors, Vasily I and Vasily II, would deal with the first with the Lithuanian threat and then an internal civil war, which went on from 1425 to 1453. Some historians believe that the Black Death led to a period of instability due to the great loss of life. The plague that devastated the town of Belozero in the 1420s caused so many people to die. Anyone that was still alive left. The St. Cyril Belozero Monastery took over most of the land, buying what it could, and simply taking ownership of the rest. When researching the plagues and epidemics that struck Europe and Asia over the centuries, it struck me how rarely they would spread into Russia. One example is the 1510 influenza pandemic, which struck Europe, North Africa, and Asia, killing an estimated 1% of those infected. This was the first well-documented influenza pandemic. It made it all the way up to the Baltic states of present-day Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, but it never made it into Russia. There were a number of reasons why many of these plagues, epidemics, and pandemics did not reach the Muscovite people. The main one is that there really wasn't a lot of travel between the land of the Rus and the rest of Europe. The Mongol yoke, which had fallen apart by 1480, had put down what you might call an invisible wall between the Rus and Europe. Another flu epidemic would start in the Ottoman Empire in 1557, spreading throughout Europe, but not reaching Russia, stopping in Poland. In 1654, another outbreak of the bubonic plague would hit Russia, being especially harsh on the people of Moscow. Now, remember when I said it didn't go through from Europe, but from Asia. This is where we see the trade routes coming from Asia, and that's where most of the bubonic plagues would start. So they would make their way into Russia. Now, this epidemic of 1654 would last for two years with what we don't know of what kind of a loss of life, but it was pretty dramatic. In 1770, an even worse eruption of the plague would ravage Moscow. It was estimated that 20% of the city and area around it would die in two years as it raced through the population. The first signs of this plague outbreak in Russia was in the Russian garrison stationed at Jassy, the capital of Moldavia, in early 1769. In May, the commander of the base, General Christopher von Stolfen, died. By the following September, Kiev was hit so hard that Empress Catherine decided to isolate the city and the surrounding area to hopefully prevent its spread. Fortunately, it failed. As I mentioned before, Moscow was getting hit with the plague so harshly that the emperor said Grigory Arlov to, take, to the city to take control. Rioting was rampant as the people were getting more and more desperate. Orlov's strong presence and his locking down of the entire city saved it from complete devastation. Catherine the Great, as the head of the Russian Empire at the time, would make another major contribution in the control of another disease, and this was from one of our previous episodes, uh, and that one took the lives of millions over the centuries, and that was smallpox. Uh, there were two forms of this virus, variola major and variola minor. The former is the most dangerous form with a death rate approaching 30%. In the 1700s, it is estimated that smallpox killed an average of, guess this, this number is incredible, 400,000 people per year in Europe alone. It also caused one-third of all cases of blindness, as well as causing scarring, causing scarring. Sometimes it could be pretty extreme. Tsar Peter III, Catherine's husband, had been affected by the smallpox virus before he became emperor. It scarred his face, which Catherine found hideous. As the Encyclopedia Britannica described Peter in their 1911 edition, quote, Nature had made him mean. The smallpox had made him hideous. And his degraded habits made him loathsome. Luckily for the future Tsarina, she was able to avoid catching the virus. But it did leave an indelible mark on her psyche. Around this time, a vaccination program was underway in Europe. The earliest method to prevent smallpox was inoculation, also known as variolation. In 
which worked by provoking a mild form of the disease in a healthy person. As we heard in that previous episode that you might have heard when I uh, interviewed uh, Miss Lucy Ward on her book, Catherine invited Sir Thomas Dimsdale from Scotland to perform the inoculation on herself, her son, and her court to set an example to the Russian people that the procedure was safe. Now, Dimsdale, as we remember, was cautious and wanted the Tsarina to let him try out the inoculations on some commoners, but Catherine was pretty firm in setting an example for the people of Russia. The inoculation of the Empress occurred on October 12th, 1768. She would come down with mild symptoms for about two weeks before recovering fully. By 1800, four years after her death, over two million Russians had been inoculated and protected from this deadly disease. Catherine said before getting the vaccine that it was done, quote, to save from death the multitude of my subjects who, not knowing the value of this technique, frightened of it, were left in danger. Before I move on, I just want to remind you that the uh, episode that I was talking about where we talk about uh, Catherine and what she did was in episode 219. It was recorded in May of this year, and it was about the book The Empress and the English Doctor by Lucy Ward. I highly recommend that book. It's really phenomenal reading, and you get to see the mind of Catherine and what she was thinking as well as the history of these type of inoculations and why they were so important to the world. Now, numerous other diseases ravaged the Russian countryside over the centuries. Cholera hit Moscow and its surrounding region twice in the 19th century. It killed 250,000 in 1830 to 1831, and over a million in the epidemic that lasted from 1847 to 1851. Caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholerae, it hit large cities around the world due to poor sanitation. It would normally center around contaminated water supplies, something that was discovered by the British scientist John Snow during an outbreak in London in the mid-1800s. If you've ever seen the, uh, the new version of Cosmos by Neil deGrasse Tyson, he would actually talk about that, and it's really fascinating. If you can see the episode on this and how John Snow figured out where... Uh, the cholera outbreaks were coming from. The cholera outbreak, though, that hit Russia beginning in 1847 was thought to have had its origins in India around 1836. It was known as the third cholera epidemic, with the second cholera epidemic making it first to the Ural Mountains before it hit Moscow, as I mentioned, in 1830. The first cholera epidemic of 1817 to 1824 made it as far as Astrakhan but never quite made it to Russia. Other diseases that would hit cities especially hard in Russia over the years included tuberculosis, typhus, dysentery, and typhoid fever. Before we go on, there's a common mistake made by some that typhus and typhoid are the same disease. They're not. While both are transmitted due to overcrowded cities with poor hygiene, they are caused by different bacterial infections. The bacterium that causes typhus is typically carried by lice, while Salmonella typhi, which causes typhoid fever, is found in contaminated water, much like cholera. One disease that was endemic in Russia over the centuries and is still a major problem to this day, and that is tuberculosis. It is so bad that a travel warning has been issued by a it's called IAMAT, or the International for Medical Assistance to Travelers, with an update being given in January of 2020. Historically, it became a major problem following World War I, the Russian Civil War, the ensuing hunger and famine, social stress, and economic migration, which all led to a tuberculosis epidemic in the early 20th century. One war that brought to light the terrible consequences of living in both unsanitary conditions and tightly packed together was the Crimean War. Cholera and dysentery were everywhere and ever-present on the battlefields. As one report put it from the book Crimea by Trevor Royal, quote, These meadows nurtured the fever, 
the og, dysentery and pestilence in their bosom. The lake and the stream exhaled at death, and at night, fat, unctuous vapors rose fold after fold from the valleys and crept up in the dark and stole into the tent of the sleeper and wrapped him in their deadly embrace. The cholera outbreak during the Crimean War favored no side. French, British, Sardinian, Ottoman, Russian, and Polish troops were killed by the thousands. It also took no carers to the class or standing of those who would die. Generals down to the common soldier would fall. Those who did not die would be so weakened that they would be unable to attend conferences to discuss tactics. Now, here's some statistics that I want you to you know, think about when it comes to the Crimean War. And this one was particularly brutal because of the disease, not so much the fighting. The estimates of deaths caused by disease during the Crimean War is absolutely staggering. The British, French, Ottomans, and Sardinians lost 110,000 men, while the Russians suffered over 377,000 deaths. To put this into perspective, the Allied deaths due to combat was 45,000, and the Russian casualties were 72,000. That means that approximately five men died of disease, for every one who died in the actual fighting. The next epidemic we will discuss today, we have the so-called Russian flu of 1889 to 1890. It would kill over one million people worldwide, with the majority of deaths occurring in Russia. Now, the reason I put this epidemic here is because recent evidence suggests that this flu was not your standard influenza outbreak, but something like what we have gone through, and it may have been indeed a coronavirus like COVID-19. The victims of the so-called Russian flu were the elderly and those with underlying conditions, much like COVID. Many died of pneumonia and heart attacks. Again, more similarities to COVID-19. And Danish researchers Lone Simonsen and Anders Gorm Peterson believe that this may be the original virus that split from its bovine sources 130 years ago and is attacking us today, still. Now, the paper has been published, but we do have to take this with a grain of salt. Now, there's been other work done known as seroarchaeology that suggests that the Russian flu is indeed a version of the H3N8 strain. But that is being called into question as well. Whatever the truth is, this flu, or COVID, was deadly. It was first reported in the city of Bukhara in Uzbekistan in May 1889. The Trans-Caspian Railway, which was completed before the Trans-Siberian Railway, allowed the virus to spread. First to Samarkand in August, then onward to Tomsk by October. Shortly after, it hit St. Petersburg, where it infected over 18% of the 1 million inhabitants. From there, it reached Kiev and Moscow. By the end of 1889, all of Europe was engulfed, and by late December, the United States began to report its first cases. The spread of this virus was almost unheard of with its speed of travel. Within four months, it had reached the entire Northern Hemisphere, which suggests that it may have indeed been a coronavirus because that passes much easier than the flu. Now, interestingly enough, one of the survivors of this epidemic was Tsar Alexander III. While I haven't seen anyone else propose this, I'm going to do it here for the first time. Four years later, Alexander was to die prematurely at the age of 49. While the official cause of death was nephritis of the kidney, could it have been a long-term effect of being infected by the coronavirus? This is long COVID. And according to research published in 2020 in the journal Cell, there is ample evidence that the coronavirus can indeed attack the kidney by binding to a type of receptor on the cells called ACE2. These receptors are also found in the heart and lungs, two major targets of the coronavirus. 
What we do know is that it can cause nephritis in the kidneys. Whether this is true in the case of the death of Alexander III, we will never really know, but it is in the realm of possibility. Now, I first wrote about this uh, in my Patreon uh, version of Russian history, and this was in 2020. Now, today in 2022, we now know that there's going to be some real problems down the road from the coronavirus affecting many of us. And the big thing is nephritis of the kidneys, heart damage, and lung damage. So it's something that we're going to need to really work on to try to prevent this. So we may start seeing an uptick of people dying or suffering from kidney disease in maybe 2024 through 2026. This, again, is uh, theoretical on my part, but it is something that I've been doing a lot of research on, and I'm really concerned about this. So everybody, take care of your kidneys if you can. Uh, the last epidemic, though, to hit Russia, aside from COVID-19, was just a few decades ago, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. The whole of the Russian medical system was collapsing, which led to a number of infectious disease outbreaks. In the summer of 1992, a cholera outbreak hit Nizhny Novgorod, Krasnodar, as well as Moscow. An outbreak of anthrax hit the Altai region, followed by typhoid fever in Volgodonetsk. Even worse, suicide rose by 20% between 1991 and 92. Maternal mortality rates skyrocketed to over five times that of Western Europe. As Lori Garrett put it in her book, The Coming Plague, quote, alcoholic self-destruction, drunk driving accidents, and homicides ranked as the remaining top causes of the excess death rates. While not infectious epidemics, it was a full-blown health crisis, and I believe it is an epidemic that is still occurring in Russia today. Uh, they have a very big problem with alcoholism and severe damage that comes from that. Dr. A.V. Yablokov, a special counsel to President Boris Yeltsin, said at the time when talking about the health crisis, quote, among these are all forms of tuberculosis, some infectious diseases like measles, whooping cough, tetanus, typhoid fever, respiratory disease, pregnancy complications, and diseases of the perinatal period. In 1993, there was a massive outbreak of diphtheria, killing hundreds. What is striking is that it is totally preventable disease, as we have vaccines that are routinely used around the world. What we don't know much about Russia's health issues during this time is the number of diseases called by HIV AIDS. First, because the old communist regime didn't want the outside world to know how bad things were, and then the incompetence of Yeltsin's rule and the collapse of the medical system. So we will never really know how many people died. According to reports, over 1 million people in Russia have AIDS or HIV. Back in 18, 1986, a Soviet health official, Vladimir Trofimov, spoke on state television about the troubling new infection that was making international headlines. He said, quote, this is a Western disease. But there is no base here for the spread of this disease, since in Russia, there is no drug addiction and no prostitution. Of course, we know this to be false. A major problem in Russia today is that they refuse to offer widespread testing for HIV. They simply don't want to know to avoid the bad press that comes with it. Maria Godlaskeva a project coordinator at the St. Petersburg-based EVA organization, herself HIV infected for over the past 20 years, said this, quote, This lack of testing means married couples are now infecting each other because one of them didn't know that the other had been HIV positive for years. Experts have estimated the true number of HIV positive people in Russia is approximately 1.5 million. In five Russian cities in Siberia and the Ural region, Chelyabinsk, Irkutsk, Samara, Tolyata, and Ekaterinburg, more than 1.5% of the population is HIV positive. 
One of the other reasons for the lack of testing and the lack of education about HIV's transmission through sex, mostly heterosexual in Russia, is the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, also methadone, which international researchers say can lower the risk of passing on the virus by reducing intravenous drug use, is banned in Russia, and anyone supplying it faces up to 20 years in prison. Anya Sarong, the director of the Andrei Rilkov Foundation, said, quote, The government believes that any work carried out in the accordance with the WHO's international recommendations is work aimed at introducing a corrupting Western influence on Russian youth. This paranoia about Western influence continues to plague modern-day Russia. It is pretty much ingrained into its psyche. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and learned a few things. Join me next time when I move on to an entirely different topic yet again with a new series, a two-parter, on the development of literature in Russia and the Soviet Union. So, until next time, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.